You're listening to an Ono Media Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. Okay, everyone, if you're watching on YouTube right now, please go give this video a thumbs up and subscribe. Turn on notifications. Just get us to the top of the algorithm. Let's go. And if you are listening on podcast and you can leave us a review and yeah, that that's my call out for today. I know we say it all the time, but guess what? We can, we just got to we got to keep saying it. Hope everyone's doing great. Back in action. Feeling a lot better. Hoping our voices don't sound as nasally anymore. We're good to go. Like for a couple weeks, but our bodies did it. We're Drunk recovering. Bodies. We're recovering. Um, also, just a reminder real quick, we have bonus content on Apple subscriptions and Patreon. So go sign up for those if you want ad-free and bonus content. All the announcements we got for everybody today. You know, next week's episode is episode 200 of Murder With My Husband. Two freaking hundred. Obviously, that's not including the bonus episodes that yes. are on um, our that subscriptions. That means but. we've been doing it for 200 weeks. Would that be correct then? Well, the first no, when because, we first started, we yes. were doing two weeks. So... Mm. That is true. I forgot about that. I think technically no. Yeah, we're technically probably out at like 190. But still, 200 episodes of Murder With My Husband. When we started, did you ever think like 200 regular episodes? A lot of episodes. And here we are, coming back every single week, hanging out with you guys. We really appreciate it. It does just feel like a dream. All right. Do you have your 10 seconds? Oh, man. Good old 10 seconds. Honestly, just kind of getting back in the working mode. We had a couple birthdays for family, so we've been doing that. We actually finally did Christmas with my mom because Peyton and I were sick, so we had to wait until just a couple days ago. Mm -hmm. Finally did Christmas with her. We did some present exchanges, and I worked out for the first time again yesterday because I'm healthy. It was really hard. It was so hard. Holy crap. We're back watching Pickleball on TV. I feel like there hasn't been any good movies or TV shows that I've been in love with lately. Any suggestions? I'm always open to suggestions. Just a reminder, I've seen a lot of TV shows. Um, but I, I feel like I've been on Netflix, Hulu, HBO. I've been looking around. I can't find anything new. We did talk about starting Desperate Housewives Salt Lake City. From the beginning, because we've never mm. watched any of them, but we heard that the finale was just like to die for. So that was more of a Peyton thing. But you said you would watch with thing. me. I said I'd consider it. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I will highly consider it because I can't find anything else right now. So if no one gives me anything good, I'm going to be watching Desperate Housewives with my wife, which I would love to do because I love her. But if someone gives me something good, I might be watching something else. That's what I got for my 10 seconds. Let's hop into today's episode. Okay, our sources for this episode are from A Whisper to a Rallying Cry by Paula Yu, The New Yorker, AsiaSociety.org, CNN, Zen Education Project, AllIt'sInteresting.com, History.com, NPR, New York Times, Huffington Post, NBC News, and PBS. So every once in a while, a case comes along that completely upends history and yet somehow never makes it into most history books. Now, I'm not talking about a case that gets a new law passed or an amendment to the already existing judicial process, which in and of itself is a huge achievement, as we know. No, some cases are so big, they're so powerful, they spark an entire civil rights movement, just like the one I'm going to tell you about today. It's a case that's been buried pretty deep in our nation's backstory. And I think we owe it to the victim, Vincent Chin, and his family, as well as the entire Asian American population, to talk about it, to keep passing it on. Because to not know about the murder of Vincent Chin is to have skipped an entire chapter in American civil rights history. And I promise it's as frustrating and as moving as I'm hyping it up to be. So let's start at the beginning, even before Vincent Chin was born. With another crucial character in our story, Vincent's mother named Lily Chin. Lily grew up in China in one of the nation's largest cities known today as Guangzhou. During World War II, she and her family retreated to the mountains outside the city as the new communist leader Mao Zedong fought to establish the People's Republic of China. 
And that's when Lily started dreaming of what life would be like in a democracy, particularly in America. After the war was over, Lily wrote letters to a young Chinese-American soldier in the States, a man named David Chin. In 1945, he came back to China to meet Lily face-to-face, and the connection they'd been building was solidified. The two were undoubtedly in love. They got married in 1946, and after, David brought Lily back to America with him to begin their lives together. So this dream she's been having kind of starts to become true. Yeah, it comes true. They found themselves in a modest apartment in Detroit, Michigan, particularly in the neighborhood of Highland Park, which at the time was a gentrifying middle-class area. By the 1950s, the couple was looking to expand their family and actually decided to adopt. Pouring over images of young children at a foster home back in China, there was one little boy that caught Lily's eye. A four-year-old named Jen. He was the only one smiling back at the camera. And Lily felt an immediate connection to Jen. In that smile, she saw her destiny. that She was to become his mother. And she did everything in her power to make sure that came to fruition. After a long and exhausting process, David and Lily finally had all the paperwork to bring Jen over to America. They even gave him a more American sounding name, hoping to help him fit in a bit more as a minority in their community they were living in. From then on, the six-year-old Jen became known as Vincent. While Lily herself had a hard time assimilating with the predominantly white community, Vincent seemed to adjust quickly. In Detroit at the time, Asians made up less than 1% of the city's population, only about 7,600 in a sea of 1.2 million. Still, Vincent found plenty of new friends while always maintaining a cheery and optimistic outlook. He always wore a little tie to school to make sure he looked his best. Lily said even as Vincent got older, he was always a wonderful, well-behaved kid. Her only complaint? Vincent was too much of a ladies' man. Oh, Vincent. He was the life of the party and would charm the pants off nearly every girl he met. Oh, you ladies' man. A romantic at heart, Vincent loved to write poetry and dreamed of doing it professionally one Mm. day. But Lily encouraged him to choose another path. Being a writer was too risky, she said. And one day, he'd want a steady job to be able to provide for his own family. Always heeding the advice of his mother, Vincent put his writing dreams on the back burner and instead went to the Lawrence Institute of Technology to get his engineering degree. But he never really shook that romantic side. In 1978, the now 23-year-old Vincent met the woman he knew he wanted to spend the rest of his life with. He first laid eyes on the 20-year-old Vicky at a dance, and right away, the two were smitten with one another. He began writing poetry again, calling Vicky his muse, winning her over with his words. And about a year later, he asked Vicky if she would marry him. They took their time setting the date and finally landed on June 28, 1982. While it was still a little over two years away, the couple worked hard to save money for their wedding and a house. Vincent worked at an engineering company as a computer tech operator during the week, and on the weekends, he took an additional job of waiting tables at the Golden Star Restaurant. Unfortunately, though, 1981 was tough on the Chin family. Vincent's father, David, died from kidney disease. Oh, wow. Less than a year before his, his father, son. as in his adoptive father, yes. correct? Okay. This was less than a year before his son was meant to walk down the aisle. Oh. This only inspired Vincent to work harder to make sure he was leaving something behind for the ones he loved. He and Vicky decided right after their honeymoon in Aruba, they would begin trying for their own family. Even have his mother Lily move in with them to help care for their little additions. And as June 1982 inched closer, Vincent got only more excited about the future he was building for himself. Unfortunately, it would all come crashing down only nine days before he tied the knot. Um. It was on the night of June 19th. It was a Saturday afternoon and a much slower day at the restaurant than Vincent was used to. He was cut early that night and decided maybe this would be the perfect evening for a little impromptu bachelor party. Vincent didn't have anything planned, but the opportunity had presented itself. So he called some of his closest friends to see if they were free. It was Robert Sorosky, Jimmy Choi, and Gary Koivu, all that agreed to join him. 
They started the night by passing around a bottle of vodka. The plan was to head over to the Fancy Pants Lounge, but the strip club didn't sell alcohol on the premises. Mm. So the guys wanted to make sure they had a good buzz on before they went inside. <laughs> okay. Vincent and his friends took their seats right in front of the stage. The dancers were happy to perform for Vincent, who was eager to hand over a fistful of ones for each dance. The night was going well for everyone inside the Fancy Pants Club until two other customers walked through the front doors. The men took their seats across the stage from Vincent. But a short time after, Vincent and his friends heard the white men throw some racial slurs mm. out over the music. Do not like where this is going. Then one of them made a bizarre remark. He said, it's because of you that we're out of work. Now, I need to take a pause what here the? to explain this because it probably makes no sense out of context. And yet it's the catalyst for this entire story. So in the 1980s, the American auto industry wasn't doing very well. One of the reasons was because the price of gas was soaring and American-made cars just weren't as gas efficient. But Japanese cars were a bit better about this. So they were driving stiff competition, cutting into American profits with their massive imports. And Detroit, well, that was one of the auto uh, industry capitals is, of the yes. nation, uh -huh. which meant a lot of people in Detroit had been laid off and lost their jobs thanks to the competition from Japanese car makers. Got it, I see. Suddenly, their well-paying jobs with really good benefits were gone. And, I mean, people were angry. It was ugly out there. Like, it wasn't unusual to open up the paper and see that someone was shot at while driving on the freeway oh in a Japanese-made car. Okay. In fact, even Ronald Reagan used the issue as political fuel during his 1980 presidential campaign, saying, quote, Japan is part of the problem. Got it. So I know you're wondering, what does all this have to do with Vincent Chin? Absolutely nothing and everything all at the same time. Well, it's also ironic because he's not even Japanese. No, Vincent he's, he's is Chinese. Chinese. So, I mean, that's completely different. That's like saying someone from America and someone from Ireland. Yeah. Right? It's two completely different countries. And he doesn't, nor has he ever worked for a car manufacturing company. Like, he's that an engineer. Well. Yeah. Yet the men sitting across from him at the Fancy Pants Lounge have. It was 43-year-old Ronald Evans, who was an employee at Chrysler, and his 22-year-old stepson, Michael Nitz. They had recently been let go as employees at Chrysler. And they're fired up, seemingly ready to take their aggression out on any Asian person who looks at them the wrong way. In fact, the strip club wasn't even part of the duo's original plans for that night. Michael had gotten into a fight with his girlfriend earlier that day, so his stepdad, Ron, thought he would take him out for the night to the strip club to cheer him up. They grabbed a few beers at the neighborhood bar and then figured, why not catch the end of the Detroit Tigers game? But on the way over, they heard on the radio they were already down by seven points, so the two men decided not to bother. Instead, they pulled over at the Fancy Pants Strip Club looking for something else to do. Is it called the Fancy Pants? Or is are you saying like it's a fancy place? No, it's called the Fancy Pants Strip Club. It's called the Fancy. Okay, got it. Um, And let's just say that whatever they were looking for at this lounge, they found it. So here we have two groups of men who found their way to this club by pure chance that evening. Yet what followed would change the course of history. Oh, no. Because after Ron yelled across the stage at Vincent, it's because of you, we're out of work. Vincent got out of his chair and approached the two guys. Okay. Then Vincent shoved Ron in the chest. Suddenly, chairs were being tossed and one of the dancers spotted Ron throwing a punch in Vincent's direction. The whole thing lasted about a minute or two before the security guards broke up the fight and began escorting Vincent out of the club. But in the heat of the moment, Vincent yelled back over his shoulder at Ron and Michael that he'd be waiting for them outside. Got it. And unfortunately, the two men took him up on that promise. Outside, the 5 foot 10, 150 pound Vincent began taunting the 6 foot 1, 190 pound Ron. Ron, who looked back at his stepson Michael, saw that his head was bleeding badly from the scuffle that had happened inside. And that's when he just snapped. Ron grabbed a baseball bat from his trunk oh, no. and began walking swiftly toward Vincent, which was when Vincent turned and ran. I mean, this is no longer just yeah. a you know, fist fight. This has turned into there's some weapons. 
Ron, unable to keep up with the younger Vincent, told Michael to hop in the car. Then they went cruising around the neighborhood looking for Vincent. What about his friends? They're just in the club? No, his friends are with him. Oh, so they're all running. Yes. Okay. About 20 minutes later, they found Vincent outside of McDonald's laughing with his friend Jimmy Choi, which of course only angered them more. Like they're taking this seriously. They're in their car on the yeah. lookout and he's just still goofing off with his friends. Ron and Michael could have driven home that night at this point. They could have called it quits, taken Michael to the hospital for stitches maybe. Instead, they chose to pull into the McDonald's parking lot and pick up exactly where they had left off. Michael snuck up on Vincent, taking him in a bear hug from behind while Ron got out of the car with his baseball bat. Oh my gosh. I Vin do not want to know the rest. Vincent managed to squirm out of Michael's grip and ran into the street, tripping into oncoming traffic. But when he looked up, he saw Ron standing over him. And that's when Ron began swinging. Once in the back, then again in the face, the head, the stomach. Blood was pouring out of Vincent's body and Ron was not stopping. Nor did he care that a group of people were watching in absolute horror from just a few feet away. A group who said Ron appeared to be swinging for a home run because he was badgering Vincent so hard with this bat. The only saving grace were the two police officers who'd been eating inside the McDonald's as they saw the crowd form outside. They rushed after Ron, screaming while they pointed their guns in his direction. And that's when it washed over Ron, the severity of his actions. He slowly put the bat down on the ground as he raised his hands in the air. But it was too late. The damage had already been done. Jimmy ran over to his friend, who was now choking up blood. As Vincent whispered to some of his last words, fight, fight, it's not fair. Jimmy raced to a payphone to call an ambulance. When the EMTs arrived, one of them claimed that in their 11 years of work, they had never seen someone so badly oh. beaten as Vincent Chin had been. By that point, Vincent was already in fatal condition, slipping in and out of consciousness. When he reached the hospital around 10.21 p.m., most of his brain activity had stopped. He was given a 5% chance of survival. Meanwhile, Rob Evans and Michael Nitz were placed in handcuffs and taken down to the county jail. Yeah. At around 1 a.m., Vincent went into a five-hour emergency surgery to try and relieve the blood clots that were blocking blood flow to the rest of his brain. The swelling was so severe that doctors had to remove a portion of Vincent's brain to increase any chance of survival. However, when they finished around 6 a.m. on June 20th, Vincent's condition still hadn't improved. His mother, Lily, came to see him shortly after. At that point, Vincent was in a coma and on life support. The first thing she thought about was how his new haircut, the one he'd just gotten in preparation for his wedding, was now ruined by these surgical scars. Meanwhile, Ron Evans and Michael Nitz were at the police station getting charged with second-degree murder. And because they had no criminal record, they were actually released without bond what for the, the time being. What the freak? Which is absolutely... How does that even happen? Well, it's also shocking to Officer Cotton, one of the cops who stopped the fight, because he's like, I've seen people go to jail for having marijuana on them, and these guys beat someone from an inch of his life, and they get to sleep in their own beds tonight. Um, like, they were just in and out. That's annoying. Nothing about that situation is fair, yeah. particularly because Vincent Chin is now lying in a hospital bed with his mother and soon-to-be wife crying beside him. And that's where they stay for the next four days until Lily decides it's time. Vincent's not going to improve. Yeah. His brain had ceased to function. So on June 23rd, 1982, Lily took her son off life support, which is a decision no parent should ever oh, have to make her husband dies then her son dies that's that's really hard and on june 28th guests who should have been dressing for vincent and vicky's wedding that day were instead getting ready for vincent's funeral yeah for eight whole months after the fact michael and ron went about their lives as they waited for their day in court when february 9th 1983 rolled around they both pleaded no contest to the manslaughter charges with hopes that the judge would go easy on their sentencing and it worked maybe a little too well because not only did they not have to face a trial now, the judge ruled overwhelmingly in their favor. And this is going to absolutely disgust you, but here's what Judge Kaufman gave them. Three years probation and a $3,000 fine. For what happened? Wait, for killing somebody? For beating Vincent Chen to death. It was manslaughter, correct? Was yeah, their charge? Manslaughter. 
and he gets three years? How is that Probation. Even, how is that even possible? And you know what Judge Kaufman said after he delivered this sentencing? Uh-huh. These weren't the kind of men you sent to jail. We're talking here about a man who's held down a responsible job for 17 to 18 years and his son is employed and a part-time student. You don't make the punishment fit the crime. You make the punishment fit the criminal. Holy crap. Which, if this were actually how the judicial system worked, half of the killers we talk about on this show would be walking free right now because they, too, didn't have a criminal record before. Yeah. Even Ronald Evans admitted he was baffled by the leniency of his sentencing. He had already mentally prepared himself to go to jail for killing Vincent. But there were a lot of discrepancies with how the case and the trial were handled from the very beginning. For example, police never seemed to interview key witnesses, including the dancers at the Fancy Pants Club who heard Ron Evans originally making racial slurs, which suggested Vincent's race played a large part in his slaying. Also back then, it wasn't unheard of for the prosecutor's office to miss sentencing hearings, which in this case meant there was no one representing the Chin family that day in court. No one was there to state the victim's case. Just the judge, the two accused, and their lawyers. Lily Chin wasn't even told about the hearing. Basically, Kaufman heard one side of the story and closed the book. But Lily Chin was not going to let things end there. She knew her son was worth more than a $3,000 fine and some community service hours. So she picked up a pen and she began writing to the Detroit Chinese Welfare Council, begging for help with any appeals and further legal counsel. By March 20th, 1983, just four days after the sentencing, Lily's call was answered. That day, a group of about 30 Asian Americans came together in the back room of the Golden Star restaurant where Vincent Chen had formerly worked. Among them were Michigan's top lawyers, activists, and reporters, all putting their heads together on one important subject. They wanted to get justice for Vincent. Yeah. The biggest challenge was finding a way around the double jeopardy law. Evans and Nitz had already been found guilty of manslaughter, so the criminal case was over. They were not going to be able to prosecute on that issue again. Yeah, they'd have to do, um, I don't know the correct legal term, some sort of racism charge? Yeah, I think it's called a civil rights violation. So this is the angle they try. Together, the group formed a civil rights organization called the American Citizens for Justice, or the ACJ. And from there, they began protesting the sentencing, as well as petitioning the Department of Justice to reinvestigate the case as a civil rights violation suggesting the crime had been racially motivated. Before the trial, Vincent's death had received little press outside of Detroit. But once people heard about the ACJ's fight and the ridiculously lenient sentencing dished out to Vincent's assailants, the news spread like wildfire. By the summer of 1983, Vincent's story grew beyond national headlines to a full-on civil rights movement driven by the ACJ. Suddenly, every Asian American community was rallying together to fight for justice flooding the streets with signs and rallying cries. It was no longer just the Chinese fighting against the Chinese Exclusion Act or the Japanese fighting against residual discrimination from World War II. Now, for the first time in history, all Asian Americans from Vietnam to the Philippines to India were transcending those boundaries, coming together to collectively address racial intolerance. What's What sucks, I mean, this whole thing sucks, but... One of the ironic things is that he's mad at the Japanese, yet he killed a Chinese person. And he honestly... It just doesn't even, like, he was so ignorant to even realize there's probably even, even a difference. Right. Like, I don't know. Annoying. So acting as the de facto face of the movement was Lily Chin, who began traveling the country, attending rallies to speak about her son's case. Suddenly, every major television network was covering the protests around the country, from New York to San Francisco. Oh. Keep in mind, this was in the 80s. So the campaign for Vincent Chin even attracted celebrities in the civil rights movement like black activists, Jesse Jackson, who said, quote, these attacks on Asian Americans are no different than the atrocities of the Ku Klux Klan against blacks in the South. At that time, everyone in America, regardless of their race, knew the name Vincent Chin. And while Ron Evans and Michael Nitz may have dodged several legal recourse for their actions, The public was dishing out their own set of consequences for their actions. Just 12 days after Ron was handed that mild sentence, he was fired by his longtime employer, Mm. Chrysler. 
Now with a felony charge on his record, he couldn't find decent work anywhere else. Leaving the house in general was out of the question since Ron faced public scrutiny pretty much anywhere he went. So he mostly stayed inside his home with the curtains closed, watching TV while his wife went to work. Even his 11-year-old daughter had to change her newspaper route Oof. because people were asking her if she was, quote, that killer's daughter. And that sucks because that affects her life and she didn't do anything wrong. Right. Same with the wife. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a whole other story. So over time, Ron began to suffer from severe depression, as did his stepson, Michael Nitz, who also became withdrawn and stopped hanging out with friends. Michael became increasingly anxious and paranoid, mainly from the nonstop phone calls and threats coming to his house at all hours of the night. So while they weren't behind bars, Michael and Ron were, in a way, experiencing their own form of mental prison. Yeah. Even Judge Kaufman, who handed them their sentences, was not prepared for the wrath that followed. His office was overwhelmed with hateful letters and phone calls questioning his ability to do his job. He claimed that in all his years of work, he'd never experienced as much backlash as he had with the Vincent Chin Oh, case. bro, look what you did. Duh. Still, even with time, Kaufman stood by his decision saying if he had to do it all again, he would make the same call. Yeah. Oh, wait, what? Yeah. He said he wouldn't change a thing, so he doubled down basically on- Doubled down. Okay. But luckily, the decision was no longer in Kaufman's hands because by June of 1983, a year after Vincent's death, the ACJ had their first big win. The Department of Justice had agreed to investigate Vincent's case. Come November, a federal grand jury indicted Ron Evans and Michael Nitz on charges that they had violated Vincent's civil rights, more specifically for interfering with his ability to enjoy a public space on account of his race. Mm. Now, this was huge because this was the first federal civil rights trial in the U.S. involving an Asian American. Yeah. So the following year, on June 13th, 1984, Michael Nitz and Ron Evans were back in court. But the question was no longer, did they murder Vincent Chin? That, that had already been answered. Now the jury was there to decide, was this crime racially motivated or was this just the result of some drunken bar fight? Well, this time, witnesses were called to testify, including some of the dancers who'd heard Ron make racial slurs in Vincent's direction prior to the fight breaking out, along with the one phrase that really set them off, the, it's because of you that we're out of work. A line that felt to most people like a racially charged accusation. I'm curious to where this goes as well, um, just because Vincent pushed him first, correct? Mm -hmm. At least that's what the witnesses say. Yeah, the witnesses say Vincent got up and took okay. the fight. Doesn't make what happened no, in the no, end no, okay, no. but I'm just curious because that will affect things. These stories have multiple layers, correct. right? Yep. And this racially charged accusation, the it's because of you were out of work, is one that seemed to wrongfully imply there was no difference between a Chinese and a Japanese man. But there was another witness that proved to be crucial to this argument, a man named Jimmy Perry, who was 19 at the time of the crime. Jimmy had been simply walking down the street that night when Ronald and Michael pulled over to ask him a question. According to Jimmy, the men rolled down their windows and asked Jimmy if they'd seen two chinese guys in the area okay this was after vincent had fled the parking lot and retreated to that mcdonald's and they were on the lookout for him yeah. jimmy was skeptical to say anything at first he sensed trouble he could smell the alcohol on their breath even from outside of the car plus michael was bleeding from his head so jimmy asked if they just wanted to go to the hospital but michael was insistent he handed jimmy a 20 dollars bill and asked him again would he be willing to help them find and catch the chinese guys Jimmy, not knowing what he was in for, hopped in the back seat and went along with them, eventually ending up at that McDonald's. It was the constant mention of Vincent's race by Evans and Nitz, by several witnesses throughout the trial that really got the jury thinking. I mean, they basically said before killing him that night, they brought up his race multiple times and multiple people heard it. So after 12 hours of deliberation, they came back with a verdict. On June 28, 1984, on the two-year anniversary of what should have been Vincent's wedding, they found Michael Nitz not guilty, but Ron Evans guilty of violating Vincent Chin's civil rights. Evans was sentenced to 25 years in prison for this. Got it. Okay. Only Ron didn't go to prison right away. Instead, he got to stay home with his team while they appealed his case, claiming a legal error had affected the outcome. I was going to say, I'm sure this is just going to be a lot more 
legal crap going on. Uh huh. Another two whole years passed after he was given the 25 year sentence when the Court of Appeals finally agreed to overturn his conviction. So he still hasn't spent a day in prison. Oh, and they overturned it. Yes. Wow. But that didn't rule out the possibility of another trial. On September 19th, 1986, the Department of Justice announced once again, Ronald Evans would have another day in court, which meant Lily Chin was going to have to relive this whole ordeal over again. She'd have to sit before a judge and listen to the horrific details of how her son had died another time. And there was still no guarantee that he would get the justice he deserved. Unfortunately, that was all out of her hands. And in April of 1987, a new trial began. They even granted Evans' request to move the hearing to Cincinnati, where less people knew the case and would hold less bias against him. Which I'm, su I'm not surprised they did that. But the question remained the same. Was this a drunken fight that had gotten out of control or was this a case of racial violence? Yeah. Well, this time the jury, which was made up of mostly blue collar white men like Ronald Emmons, decided he was not guilty of violating Vincent Chen's civil rights. Wow. And that was that. It was a pretty devastating ending to Vincent Chen's story. When Lily stood before the press, she could barely muster up the strength to say, quote, my life is over. Vincent's soul will never rest. Lily later went on to file a civil lawsuit against Evans and Nitz for the wrongful death of Vincent. She was awarded $65,000 from Nitz and $1.5 million from Evans, who would hand over a portion of his monthly earnings as long as he was employed, except he wasn't employed. He's not employed, yeah. He actually never worked full-time again, which meant he never paid a single penny of that $1.5 million to the Chin estate. But truthfully, no amount of money would have healed the pain Lily felt. Feeling so let down by the justice system, Lily decided to move back to China where she lived until she passed away in 2002. Oh, that's it? Meanwhile, Ron and Michael's actions continued to haunt them over the decades. Every year on June 19th, a crowd of protesters stand in front of Ronald's house with signs devoted to the memory yeah. of Vincent Chin. I mean, at least, yeah, I don't know. And well, it also shouldn't be the public's job no to deliver justice no like sure. there's a justice system for this reason yeah and now well into his 80s he still receives threatening phone calls from strangers at all hours of the day and while vincent's attackers may have never gotten the justice they deserved his case was seen as a turning point when it came to asian american civil rights not only did he inspire the foundation for several activist groups his legacy led to the passage of several laws against hate crimes in the united states legislature on top of that, his case exposed a lot of the problems with manslaughter sentencing in the state of Michigan. We've talked about this before. Um, just some of the sentencings don't make any sense. Because it's like, I could maybe see them saying manslaughter at the bar, you know, but the fact that they drove around looking for him, found him. Isn't that found premeditated him, murder? That he, feels like it to me. And he went and grabbed a, a baseball bat? It's no different than grabbing a weapon. Like, I don't understand how that's not premeditated. Well, that's why there were changes made after his case, because what is manslaughter? Yeah. And in part helped change the guidelines around the mandatory minimum sentencing so that no one is ever walking away with a sentence as lenient yeah. as Evans and Nitz got. Isn't five years the minimum now? I'm not sure exactly what. I didn't look it up. Are. I'm not sure either. Okay. But Vincent's case also ensured that victims would always be represented during sentencing hearings to avoid only one side of the story ever being told. So from now on, uh, both sides had to be present. It. More than anything, Vincent's case showcased the power of the Pan-Asian community in the U.S. for the very first time. But even some of our nation's most critical cases get lost in the archives of history. And Vincent Chins was certainly one of them. I just think it was important that we as a nation be reminded of Vincent Chin's case because when stories as powerful and transformative as this are forgotten, that's when history is just doomed to repeat itself. And I'm so grateful for all of the changes that were made. But again, it's always so unfortunate and unfair and unjust that a case like this has to happen in order for progress to be made. It's sad that the dad died. And he died and the mom moved back to China and she died. Like the whole family's just gone. Yeah. Like that whole generation basically. And like how devastating really that his wedding day ended up being his funeral. Yeah. And it also is heartbreaking that something that had nothing to do with him. Like this literally had nothing to do with him. It's like, what are the chances they're in the same bar? Like, 
Yeah. Come on. Like, and then he's literally murdered for it for for hate. For hate. That is the story of Vincent Chin. And we will see you guys next week with our 200th episode. And I have picked a certain case that I heard once and kind of stuck with me through the years and I've yet to cover it. So I um, am excited to cover it for our 200th episode and we will see you next week. I love it. I hate it. Goodbye. Mm.